Welcome to our continuing quest to develop the mind of Christ, enabled by the Word of Christ, grounded in the Gospel of Christ. I have been emphasizing that the Gospel of Christ is the source of salvation, that the Word of Christ is the story of salvation, and that justification is the system of salvation by which God has provided a way for humanity to be restored to a right relationship with Him. And again, justification is when an unrighteous and undeserving sinner is made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Now, I've emphasized that alone. <clears throat> I have also emphasized that justification and salvation are two sides of the same coin. If you are saved, then you are justified. If you are justified, then you are saved. Now, so far in chapter 5, we have transitioned from the theological to the practical aspects of justification. In verses 1 through 2, we examine the theological aspects of peace with God, the grace of God, and rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. In verses 3 through 5, we started our practical examination of justification by observing aspects of a chain of virtues from rejoicing and suffering that produces perseverance, experience, maturity, and hope because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, in the last lesson, in verses 6 through 11, we dug deeper into the meaning of God's love poured out. We are ungodly and powerless, yet Christ died for us. Sinners, yet God demonstrated his love for us and enemies of God, yet we, yet He reconciled and saved us. Now, as Paul digs deeper into practical justification in verses 12 through 21, he identifies features to the fact of sin by asserting that Adam and Christ are two focal points of history. Every fact is comp now think about this. Every fact is composed of features. For example, the resurrection is a fact, but there are features behind that fact. The empty tomb, post-resurrection appearances, and the arrival of the Holy Spirit, among others. Now, verses 12 through 21 reveal features behind the fact of practical justification by examining sin, death, and grace as reigning powers, the sin-producing effects of the law, and the corporate structures of the in Adam versus in Christ relationship. Now, these features are concepts that will dominate our study when we move into chapters 6 through 8. However, Paul is introducing them here. So, when Paul declares that the whole world was guilty before God, he based his assertion on the fact of sin. In verses 12 through 21, though, <clears throat> Paul will again shift gears. He paints... From a God's eye view, the history of redemption. Paul asserts that sin is in the world and is operative, act, and let me say this way, and is an operative, active agent. Sin, I'm talking about. <clears throat> now, his canvas is human history, and the scope is universal. We hear nothing in verses 12 through 21 of Jews and Gentiles. Come on. From God's perspective, 
It is, we are corporate under the larger category, the world. All humanity stands in relationship with two focal points of history, or two focal points in history, and that is Adam and Jesus Christ, whose actions determine the eternal destiny of all who belong to them. Either one belongs to Adam under the sentence of eternal death because of his sin of disobedience, or one belongs to Christ, assured of eternal life because of his righteous act of obedience. Come on. The actions of Adam and Christ are similar in having consequential, devastating, and significance. But they are not equal in power. Christ's obedient act is able to completely overcome the impact of Adam's disobedient act. So, anyone who accepts the gospel of Christ receives the security of justification in that the sting of death and the power of sin are mitigated and mortified. That means literally brought to no effect. 1 Corinthians 15.54c and 56 says, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? And where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Now, it was sin that brought humanity under death's reign. The law of God, okay, gives sin its power in that it reveals our sin and condemns us because of our sin. We're going to be all over that in chapter 7. All right. The power of Christ's act of obedience to overcome Adam's act of disobedience is the theme of verses 12 through 21. So, in this lesson, verses 12 through 14, we examine the entry of sin and death into the human condition. So, I am at point number one. The principal cause of sin. That's verse 12a. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man. That's, that, there it is. Now, in this context, the word therefore is not only a connecting conjunction where preceding information is linked to current information, nor is it only a continuing conjunction that allows one to present, present more information. In this case, it is also a comparative conjunction followed by the phrase, just as. Now, we got to look at this closely. I've been really studying, getting in on this. <clears throat> From that, we, uh, we can, together can conclude that the principal cause for sin is one man. 1 Corinthians 15.22 identifies that man as Adam. It says, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now, this suggests that Paul's focus is not at this point on the corporate significance of Adam's act, but on his role as the instrument through whom sin and death were unleashed in the world. Okay, you with me? <clears throat> now, now, I'm going to say this too. Not everyone embraces the biblical explanation of sin. Now, if you know, we all know that's true. So instead, some people have accepted a humanistic principle or the humanistic principle, I'll say it that way, of evolution. But here's the, here's, here's the problem with that. Evolution cannot and does not explain the existence of sin or why it impacts all humanity. I mean... It can't do it. There's no explanation out of evolution that, that deals with 
Why? We have a fallen nature. So, so to develop the mind of Christ, one must recognize that human history cannot be told apart from the matter of sin. Sin is the fundamental answer to the current human condition. All right, I'm at point number two. The penal consequence of sin. That's verse 12b. And death through sin. Okay, now. And in this way, death spread to all people because all people sin. All right? Now, Paul claims that sin came in the world through one man, and through sin, death. That's what Paul said. So, that, that indicates there is an unbreakable connection between sin and death, and that's made clear in Genesis 2 and 3. The penal consequence follows the principal cause. The penal consequence is death. Death is sin's shadow. I'm slowing down a little bit. So, for review, sin is rebellion. It is literally missing the mark. It is the power one experiences that draws him or her to disobedience and transgression. Death is separation. I'm going to, uh huh. The power which defeats or ends life, which is the antithesis of creation. Everything living dies. The question is why? Because of sin. But what does Paul mean here in this verse by death? The Bible speaks of death. Now let, let, let's, I'm doing a little, let's, let's do this little background <clears throat> in two senses: physical death. And spiritual death. So I'm going to start with physical death. Paul could be, come on, referring to physical death. Since death in verse 14 seems to have this meaning. But here's, the, here's what's going on. But the passage, think about this, goes on to contrast death with eternal life in verse 21. Now you can read ahead and check, check me out. Also, in verses 16 and 18, Paul uses condemnation in the same way he uses death. All right? So that's, that's one thought. So here's the other thought. Paul might be referring to a spiritual death, the estrangement or separation from God as a result of sin. And if not healed through Christ will lead to eternal death. Now, can I say this about Paul? Paul frequently uses death and related words to designate a physical, spiritual entity, what we call total death. Ephesians 2.1 informs us that before we came to Christ, we were dead in trespasses and in sin. This shows that one can be alive physically and dead spiritually, separated and enemy of God. So, Paul interchangeably now describes the physical and the spiritual aspects of death. But the focus here, considering verses 18 and 19, is on spiritual death. Now, I'm going to say this right, right here. I, I want to throw this... I want to throw this in here edgewise. This is, this is a, a nugget, I'll say. Please note this point. I'm slowing down and I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing it. The Bible is the only source that explains the why of death. Did you catch that? The Bi I'm going to repeat it. The Bible is the only source that explains the why of death. There is no other source outside Scripture. There is no medical or scientific, scientific explanation for why we die. The medical and 
scientific definition of death is the cessation of life. That's different from separation that I mentioned earlier. The medical or scientific explanation of why, of the why of death, is really an explanation of the how. He died of, or she died of cancer, or a stroke, or a car wreck, or something like that. Medicine and science can tell us how we die, but only God, God's word tells us why. Think about that, all right? And the why is what? Sin. But now let, let, me, let me go. Let's talk about physical death. This is where, this is where we are. The physical death, biblically, is the separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. Biblically, physical death is when one's soul departs. Okay? Genesis 3, 35, 18 says, And as her soul was departing, for she was dying. When the soul is departing, one is dying physically. This verse, I'm talking Genesis 35, now just, you know, is talking about the death of Rachel as she was giving birth. Here scripture indicates that, that the Hebrew word for soul is what animates or gives life to the body. Other versions say, as she breathed her last, which causes some to interpret one's soul as breath. However, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8 says, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now, think about this now. Think about this. Paul is not talking about one's breath being present with the Lord. Think about that for a second. Genesis 2.17 lets us know that when Adam ate the fruit, he died spiritually immediately. Now, I'm shifting gears here. All right? Because it says, in the day you eat of this, in the day you eat, you will surely die. His relationship with God was severely impacted. He experienced guilt, shame, and blame. In addition, his descendants are born enemies of God and estranged from God. All right? Because we're all born dead. All right? Come on. Now, 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 now here's the other side of, of, the, of, of physical death. Adam died physically eventually. He died spiritually immediately when he sinned and died physically eventually. Genesis 5.5 5 says Adam lived 930 years and he died. So in developing the mind of Christ, one must recognize that the penalty consequence, the, oh, let me say, the, penal, the penal consequence of sin, let me get this straight, and death did not only fall on Adam alone, but to all humanity. Now let's talk about that little part at, at, at point number three. The personal corruption of sin. This is verses 13 through 14. For before the law was good, sin was in the world. But sin is not considered when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking the law as Adam did. All right? <clears throat> now, let's think about this now. Let's just examine this little piece. Adam's personal corruption is passed to all his descendants. That's all of us. Verse 18 says, By the offense of one man, condemnation came to all men. That means what? It's a universal consequence. To have a universal consequence, 
you must have a universal cause. It was Adam's disobedience. Humanity is condemned on two grounds. One, Adam's sin is imputed to his descendants. Thus, personal, the personal corruption of every human being is a besetting sinful nature. Two, we are not only sinners by nature, but also sinners by practice. Humanity suppresses God's truth and rejects his provision. That's where we started back in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God. That's where we started with this. Many focus on discussing the fairness of our condemnation while stubbornly rejecting the remedy. Some say, I didn't eat the fruit. Therefore, my inheritance of sin is unfair. The inheritance of sin is like a genetic inheritance. Let me, let me, let's, let's, let's break this down further. Every person has a genetic composition. That's, that's just it way it is. Our genetic composition is, guess what? Inherited. I mean, I, I got a mother and a father, and I get my, I wouldn't be here without them. For example, I have inherited a gene for tallness. I am six foot seven inches tall. I also inherit a gene for baldness. I got a bald, I'm, it, it's, it's happening. But to say it is unfair is not the point of argument. It's not, it's, it doesn't, again, it's not a point of argument. It is a biological fact. Fair or not, inheritance of genes come from parents, coming from parents, is a fact. I have, now, now let me, let's, 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 let's turn, let's flip the switch a minute. I have a question to anyone who thinks it is unfair to inherit sin and death from Adam. Now, here's the question. Is it fair that you, me, or anybody else can be saved by believing the gospel of Christ that includes his death, burial, and resurrection? Is that also fair or unfair? You didn't have anything to do with eating the fruit. And you didn't have anything doing with him going to the cross either. So is it fair for you to be saved by believing that? But this is the contrast, I want to say that, that Paul works on in this passage. That's what he's talking about. However, even though sin is a personal corruption, every person is responsible and able to exercise choice against the constraints of heredity, your educational background, and social conditioning factors. Anything that, that causes you to be, well, you already got the sinful nature, but regardless of that, you can resist it. No one, I'm going to say it this way too, no one sins entirely alone, and no one sins without adding to the collective burden of humankind, which is what Christ had to bear. Now, for those, I got another point here, and another thought. For those who claim to be sinless, we got a few people that believe that. These people misunderstand practical justification and believe that he or she lives above sin. Now, here, here, here's, if you want to prove this, here's the only way. To prove that you are sinless, or that you have a sinless life, it's not to die. All right? Romans 3, 20, 6, 23, we're going to get there in a, few, in a little bit, says the wages of sin is death. Now, you may fool people for a long time. You may live over 100 years. But when they bring you in a casket or in an urn, your secret will be exposed. Sin was in the world before the law. And death reigned during this time. Therefore, sin and death exercise power independent of the law. We've been, world, we've been really working on the law. Come on. You can't be saved by the law, 
And the law can't do anything. And sin and death exercise power even with the law. All right? The people from Adam to Moses did not die because of sins committed. They died because they had the personal corruption of a besetting sinful nature. There was no transgression because transgression is a violation of a known law. Only Adam and Eve knew the law and he violated it. But for his descendants down to Moses, there was no law to violate. But they died anyway. Did you catch that? Infants do not die because of sin. They committed. They died because they have a sinful nature inherited from Adam. Death reigns. It reigns. And it reigns because of our inherited sinful nature nature. People died from, from that time who did not sin like Adam did. So let me just put a, you know, summarize this by saying there is no distinction between death because of sin and death as a punishment for sin. The result is the same. Now I'm at point number four. The perfect correction for sin. That's verse 14b. Who was a pattern of the one to come. The perfect correction for sin is him who was to come. Adam was a pattern of the one to come. Adam is the, old, is the only Old Testament character specifically called a type of Christ in Scripture. Pattern. In the Greek means tupos. From this word, we get the English word type. Theological language includes types. We have types in the Old Testament. A type is a person or object that typifies the redemption of Christ. Isaac was a type after being received off the altar. Jonah was a type after spending three days in the belly of the big fish. The tabernacle was a type. Noah's ark was a type. Old Testament types typify Christ's acts by comparison. However, Adam not only typifies Christ's acts by comparison, but also by contrast. Adam's act of disobedience had a negative effect on the world. Christ's act of obedience had a positive effect on the world. Adam's act of disobedience resulted in sin. Christ's act of obedience resulted in salvation. Adam's act of disobedience resulted in the problem of death. Christ's act of obedience resulted in the possibility of life everlasting. We need to consider the principal cause of sin the penal consequence of sin, and the personal corruption of sin because of the truth they reveal. But we must also consider the perfect correction for sin because of the trust that it requires. Again, we need to examine the principal cause, the penal consequences, and the personal corruption because of the facts they present. But we must also examine the perfect correction because of the faith it produces. We are stopping here. Practical justification is a lot to process. So we're going to slow down as we go through this passage. It is a lot. We're going to have to deal with a lot of concepts. And, 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 and we need to think this over. And, and really not rush through this section of Scripture because it sets the foundation for the rest of our uh, study in Romans. All right? So we're going we're gonna to take this a little bit at a time. So, again, the gospel of Christ is the ground and foundation for the word of Christ that enables the mind of Christ. For homework, read Romans 5, 15 through 21, and meditate on Romans 5.12.
Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. May God bless and keep you. Amen, amen, and amen.